Okay, and so we are live again um, today, everyone, and we just want to thank you for coming to our final session in this uh, webinar series. Um, we today we have a very a very wide range of um, special guests from all over the world, and we've been talking a lot about um, climate finance and carbon pricing, but we haven't really had time to discuss with young people on the ground what they're actually doing to finance youth-led projects or create green jobs for their fellow um, young people and helping their communities. So today's session is basically dedicated to that. Um, and with that, I would like to hand over to Jorge to take over the moderation. Thank you. So if everyone can hear me well, we're going to start with a brief introduction uh, from each our moderator, uh, I'm sorry, our participants, and we will just have Mauricio start. Uh, Mauricio is um, part of the SDG7 um, Youth Constituency for the United Nations Major Group um, for Children and Youth, and he is the thematic point for financing renewable energy. So Mauricio, if you can tell us a little bit about what you do from that position at the SDG7 Youth Constituency and how you're involved with, or how it relates to the topic of today, um, financing green green jobs. Hi, uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, so, well, my name is Maria Pillo. Uh, thank you, Jorge, thank you, Maria, thank you, Dolphin and Lissy Pritja. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, yeah. Um Thank it's Lisa Priya. What's the Priya? Okay. Priya. Priya. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so one of the main roles that the UNMGCY has is to serve as a facilitator for capacity building, public engagement, um, policy negotiation, and as well as um, maybe some form of a facilitator for engagement between the United Nations and youth at the same time. We try to serve as a bridge that can open up this very, um, for what it seems, very unreachable and very detached from um, local context body, just, as the, just like the United Nations, and linking more towards more localized or maybe intergovernmental, corporate, and nonprofit action. One of the main things that we're doing within um, as a thematic focal point for financing for renewable energy is to actually be able to identify what will be the best practices around the world and in order to finance, in order, sorry, in order to allocate proper funding for youth. And that will also be able to make us, sorry, to get us closer to meet SDG 7 as a whole. We understand that there's um, a lot of work to be done. It was, it has just been, um, how's it, in, in store um, this year. So it's also still a very new group, and we are still getting a lot of work in, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what will be the best, posi what is our, the best roles that we can have within the energy transition and meeting the SDG seven. All right, thank you very much, Mauricio. And indeed, the constituency um, is fairly young. Um, we just started working this year. And uh, this was probably something that should have happened years ago. But right now, due to the urgency, due to the cohesion within the youth, we, we started to, we, we kickstarted it. And there's actually so much going on that, in fact, there's something going on right now um, from the SDG 7. But now, let me hear a little bit about Lisi Priya. Uh, can you, have, can you tell us a little bit about what you have been doing um, and how that relates to financing green jobs? We would love to hear from you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lissi Priyaka Mujam. I'm eight years old. I'm an Indian climate activist and the founder of the child movement. Uh, so now uh, uh, I'm, go I'm going to tell, uh, so now I'm going to tell my speech, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, 
Thank you so much, Yalai Global Program, for inviting me here to speak in this program. Coronavirus is the testing time for our leaders and human beings. 2020 is a very crucial year to decide the future of our planet. But due to this COVID-19, it weakened our movement, but not our spirits. Uh, I had to cancel lots of my planned schedules, events, programs, activities, campaign, etc. But I still continue to plant trees nearby roads, places to my home. It's really hard to manage these lockdowns. People always tell me that you are too young to get involved in such activism. But I prove them that uh, age doesn't matter to make a difference. I am big or small, it doesn't matter. I am a good child, I'm strong, smart, intelligent and brave. Many children and youth inspire from me. You can just see in Delhi how air pollution is so dangerous and even children can't move out of the home. I'm worried about the health of the school children and small small babies. Government announced that there would be holidays for three days and again for five days, ten days, but this is not the solution. Our leaders are just busy in blaming each other instead of finding a long-term solution. They are just telling the speech. They are not doing any action. I want our world leaders to do more action. Otherwise, our future and our planet would be dying soon. They must act now to save our planet and our future. You can just see in Arctic and Malgas how icebergs are melting twice as fast as ever before. And our sea level are increasing and the earth is becoming very hot. I'm worried about the future of our planet. And many of the hot hotspots become climate hotspots now. I think you all heard in the news about Australia bushfire. More than 1 billion animals have died. Millions of trees are gone. I'm really very sad. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even take my food. Many children lost their homes. But this is the real effect of climate change. Our leaders don't have time to listen to us. What you doing here? All our voice. But this is the real climate emergency. They must act now to save our planet and our future. Today, I want to share something with everyone living in this world from my little herd. We all know we are facing a pandemic on one side and flood, drought, heat waves, cyclones, etc. on another side. Now, this is the time to wake up. This is the time to open up your eyes. This is the time to send your children and grandchildren to fight for the survival and for their own future. The best gift parents can give to their children is not a beautiful house, expensive cars, lots of money. The best gift you can give to your children is a beautiful planet. To give this planet, you have to empower yourself. If you can empower yourself, then you can empower your family. If you can empower your family, then you can empower your neighborhood. If you can empower your neighborhood, then you can empower your community. If you can empower your community, then you can empower your state. If you can empower your state, then you can empower your country. If you can empower your country, then you can empower the whole world. Empowerment means independent. Independent means freedom. Freedom is when you can protect your land and environment. Freedom is when you can protect your children's future, culture and health. Freedom is when no one can discriminate you on the basis of caste, creed, color, sex or any other differences. Freedom is when you can read and write. Freedom is when you are out of hunger. Freedom is when we are all together in this fight. Fight for your freedom. Thank you, Jayan Sanali Bhavani Praniyarfi. Thank you once again. Uh, so I have, uh, so I have, uh, mm, gone to the recycle factory and uh, I've, I've seen how it is made by the recycle waste uh, plastic. So yeah, you can see it. This is the house tiles and this is the house house roof uh, made of plastic. 
Yeah. Recycled. Uh, recycled plastic and also uh, uh and also they have made it from uh and and they have made it from the chips packet uh ice cream wrapper chocolate from yeah from the uh, recycled plastic waste uh, and this is the house roof tile and this is the house tile Well, thank you very much for that speech. I think it's very inspiring to hear um, people getting involved from some, such a young age. And as you said, age doesn't matter when it comes to having an impact or getting involved. In fact, sometimes I, I tell my students that they have actually a lot of power in their voice, um, especially when they're young, especially there's uh, a very strong echo that can be created from the youth um, and from children in particular. So I'm very happy to hear you. I'm very happy to see what you're doing, how passionate you are. And I do hope that it reaches many more children around the world, as you said, to empower them and to, as a result, empower their community and their countries and so on. Um, I think Joe is about to um, get um, connected with us. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share was as you said, when we're dealing with one crisis on one side and another crisis from the other, it gets significantly harder. And we need to tackle all of this together. One of the things that I learned from one of my classes is um, in college was one zombie, no problem. Many zombies, problem. Right now we're facing multiple crises at the same time and it's gonna be much harder to deal with not just the coronavirus, the sanitary crisis, but also the, besides the global pandemic um, is causing it, but the economic crisis, financial crisis, we also have the climate crisis and a huge biodiversity loss that is happening at the same time. So I'm very glad that you mentioned um, the need to work on all of these things together. And if we don't, uh, it's gonna be much harder um, in the future. And if we let time keep running, we're literally gonna run out of time. So, um, Given, given that um, Joe wasn't able to, to connect, um, I would like to know if um, Dolphine or Maria have some questions for Lisi or uh, Mauricio um, as of right now. Hi, Lisi. Hi, Mauricio. Hi, everyone. So, Lisi, that was really impressive. And I'm actually very happy that you've, you've actually begun your journey in the environmental activism, environmental protection at this such young age. It's very impressive what you as a young person can do. And what you're doing is you've sort of created a sort of a form of livelihood for for basically a huge part of the population. And I know where I come from in Africa, I think Maria can attest right now because of COVID-19 and climate change, we have so many number of young people who graduate from, from the university and there are no jobs because there is not enough jobs room within the, within the market to totally absorb. So what you're doing is really quite impressive. And to, to start it at this young age, it basically even means that you can even employ some of us who are a bit older than you. So I, I'm really impressed by what you've been able to do at this very young age. I just like to ask, uh, because you're doing, obviously you're doing marvelous work. How have you been, who has, is there anybody who has been supporting you to be able to do this work? Maybe encouraging you, maybe your government. Yeah, if you could just explain to us because what you're doing is really, really wonderful. Yes, Lisi. Well, I'm doing nice. Uh, I'm doing uh, online conferences, uh, climate strike. Uh, I'm doing myself. Uh, thank you, ma. Thank you. You're welcome, Lucy. I also, I, I, yeah. I also wanted. Firstly, I want to say thank you for coming um, mm -hmm. to our webinar and for inspiring young people. And I just wanted to know from you, like, how how are you motivated to start that project that you're doing of recycling plastics? Because I know you must have faced a lot of challenges doing it. And then the other the other thing is, I wanted to give you a little bit of a platform to speak about the issue happening in your country right now, 
where your government is basically telling children to go to school in the pandemic. So I just wanted you to speak a little bit about that uh, because I've seen you tweeting a lot about it and maybe people aren't so aware about what's going on. Uh, so this is a staple, uh, staple uh, and um, Uh, so it is a state. Uh, it is a uh, so this is a sample. Uh, we have not yet started it, uh, and um, and we can and we can make this in home, uh, uh, and it's also very good for our environment. Uh, uh, and and it is made up of recycle based uh, plastic. Yeah. Done. That's actually very nice to to know. Maybe Ma Mauricio could would want to maybe ask you something. You know, we could give you the floor to ask her. Maybe you know, you have something to say in light of what she does because she's doing brilliant work. Actually, I guess um, in at least that it's very very easy to just be stonewall with this kind of projects. Whenever there's a project that truly seeks to actually reform a certain system, like maybe trying to provide a decent job to people that may not have a leeway into getting one, like it's very easy to just be stonewall. It's very easy to just lose, lose drive. And I guess that question, has been resurfacing recently for me, at least. I seen like, where, how do we keep on going with whatever drive we find first, right? And like, if maybe the first reason why you started the project, what are the way bigger reasons that you keep the project on going now? And I'm very sure everyone in the meeting has experienced something similar that we just started in this entire world of climate finance or even sustainability or we started in a way different path in sustainability and what are the reasons why we keep on going now so i don't know if you'd like to answer that question but um yeah. Okay. Um, if otherwise, we can move um, towards Joe, who's now here with us. Um, Joe, are, um, can you hear me? Because um, we would like to um, hear a bit from you, uh, the organization you work with, and the kind of work that you do, how it relates to um, green um, financing, green jobs, and we would just love to hear for about three, four minutes about what your work is uh, and how it's related. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so it is a little, it's a very technical and, uh, so, uh, I don't know about it, uh, I'm just eight years old. Yeah. Okay, so Joe is, um, currently struggling with, um, network connection and, um, then I would like to switch a little bit the question towards Mauricio. And um, before moving into the energy um, specifics, um, I just want to know um, from the from a general perspective, kind of how you ask the question, just reframe it to you. Um, what are some of the challenges that you would think or say that youth are currently facing um, in pushing for adoption of green technology, financing for green jobs, specifically finding jobs um, in general in the sustainability area, and how do you think or how do you suggest this can be tackled or solved? Well, 
I guess that when it comes to uh, what are some of the challenges that youth face is every single, I mean, almost every single one of the major groups faces very sim similar challenges, um, at least within the SDG framework. One of those, one of the main ones I will say will be tokenization. I, whenever youth engage at very high level political forums, whenever youth engage at webinars, um, whenever youth engage at um, whatever type of major public engagement, there's usually this unsaid rule of we're gonna have youth be inspiring and that's gonna be it. I am very much a type of person that believes that every single meeting must lead to either inspire some other people in order to keep on doing the work that they're doing or at the very least have some type of concrete action afterwards. Um, in that sense, I well, in that sense, that is one way of ending tokenization. Another way will be of making youth respect themselves um, and be seen as figures that must be respected because in the end they are quite literally just people that are gonna be future adults, people that are gonna be taking over the planet and gonna continue on this mission of stewardship towards the planet. Another one will be that there's, at least in the more technical side of it, will be that there's a lot of trying to provide youth with microfinancing exclusively and often dismissing the fact that youth already know what issues are, what, what issues are pivotal to helping the climate transition, to help have a just, sorry, to help achieve renewable energy for all. Like youth are very knowledgeable in that sense because we're one of the main groups that experience the lack of investment in it, in that area firsthand. And at the same time, we're also the ones that face a lot of, in the end, we're gonna be the ones cleaning up if there's no, if there's not involving with us. So rather than having a whole system built, just like in the old energy sector, involving you for the get-go seems to be the best way around it. But there is a lot of squeamishness from getting youth involved in the get-go just because they're seen as as an experience or maybe not as driven, which these type of events proves wrong. And I really appreciate that as well. Yeah. I very much agree with many of the points that you raise. I think um, number one, uh, being respected as young professionals, um, you know, making um, decision makers, um, business people, the private sector in general, realize that we do have the technical preparation and background and that we're ready to go in many ways and areas. I think that's that's one of the issues, particularly speaking about the energy sector, I think it's a sector that has had for many years, very few changes, very few innovation, like very few innovation driven um, enterprises or startups and things like that. So it's about to be disrupted drastically, majorly, and they're not ready for it. They don't have the vision for it. And I think um, they see um, the youth that may be trained in these areas either as a threat or either as just just too early for, for that switch. Many things around the world, at least, uh, that I have experienced, um, that there is not, um, you know, that is not ready yet, that the change is not about to come. So I think that's number one. That's the first two issues, the trust in the situation and in us as you know, capable professionals. Then I really like what you said about making the meetings count, making those interactions worth it, not just, you know, talk, but actually have concrete actions or plans that are pushed forward as a result of whatever engagement we may have with decision makers in the private sector spe specifically. Um, I don't know if Dolphine or Maria have, I think Dolphine may have a question. Go ahead. Yes, I actually have a question. And Job, sorry, I'm sorry to be a bit skeptical. You've spoken about uh, how this youth, how do I tell, when youth go to these uh, conferences or what, they get inspiration. I think it's been like, I think 25, this should be the 20, we're going to the 26th year and we've been attending these conferences, getting inspiration ever since. So it's one inspiration, I go, same, same, 
people, same, same lot of people, you inspire them, they go, they, they leave the meetings, they feel inspired. Then after one year again, they come back again, we come and then we say, we shout the cutaway stacks, then we go back, then we come out, implementation disease, what? It's the same, same cycle. But, you know, we, we go back, we keep repeating the same cycle, then at the end of the day, you come to the ground and there's nothing happening. We, we're just sitting down in our, in, in, our, in our homes, in our countries. We, we are waiting for those applications. We apply, we get the scholarships, we go, come back. We don't do anything. We don't even take what we, what we came with to the grassroots. Don't you think it's high time that we move from this idea of one conference to the other and to the other, a lot of capacity? You know, you're building, you're recycling the same, same capacity each and every time. Don't you think it's time for young people to come with, let's say, concrete actions? I've planted maybe a million trees. I've established, you know, a vertical garden. I've done this. Like, for example, Lissy. Lissy has, has she's, she's, she's doing brilliant. She's doing, I'm sorry to say, more than us young people, me included, because she's gone ahead. She she, she does not. I'm so I'm so sure she does not know all these technical jargons and technical, you know, that we we, we crowd ourselves with. She's gone ahead. She's taken west. She's converted into something useful. So don't you think, young people, we need to move aside from this hype of conference, one conference to the other, and all this? I, I don't know what what anyone else thinks about. Maybe someone can jump in before. We actually give Joe a uh, room to share with us experiences from Africa and from Gambia. Maybe Maria or Mauricio, you'd like to respond. Could I respond real quick to that as well? Well, I guess adding in. Um, so one of the main things that I realized in my very first day at the HLPF at the higher level political forum was that that was not going to be the precise place where meaningful change was going to happen. I completely took notice of the fact that I quite honestly had like a bit of a breakdown with some of my other delegate teams that I went to the HLPF with. I was like, well, this is, if this is it, this is not going to be how we achieve change. At the time, I was not familiar at all with um, the UNMGCY. And in order to go back to that, actually, when I meant um, when I said that I went there with a whole other team of delegates, we went there with a group that I is very dear to my heart still, and that we still do work with, uh, called the British Columbia Council for International Cooperation. And the why of the reason why we were able to attend to the HLPF is because um, that group BCCIC has been really has really been doing a lot of work in the ground in various um, areas in the world. And one of our main beliefs is that we don't go to the higher level, we don't have higher level engagements just to go there and make a political statement. We really believe that change begins within the self, uh, within the individual, and also see each community, each locality as just their own agents of change. So in that sense, um, every single, to my knowledge, at least, every single person from that cohort has been involved with at least a higher level of change, a local level of change, and then an individual level of change making. And I'd say in that sense, I'm still very much in involved with the my university club, um, one of the largest sustainability clubs in my university, in the province even. But um, yeah, that is one of the things that I think gets forgotten about. Like it's very easy to just become part one more piece in the system, right? Like one more, one more brick in the wall. And just forgetting about what is actually going on in our locality. So yeah, I think that's a very fair point of bringing up. We don't have we shouldn't just be going to another event. And then next year we'll go back to the same event. No, we go to that event in order to make connections and to report on what has been working, what has not been working. Maybe some climate negotiation as well, if we have the chance to do so. And if not, we'll go back to the ground and we may change where things are a lot less restrictive and a lot less bureaucratic and we can actually take action firsthand. Thank you for that, and thank you, Dolphin, for bringing bringing it up. I think it's very important 
that we do realize where the impact um, and how like to go through the clutter um, to actually get you know traction. And I want to bring up two examples that I have from friends uh, here in Mexico who have essentially broken through some of the barriers more through the entrepreneurial side and they have created green jobs in the country in two different ways. One of them um, created the company with the idea of bringing electricity access around Mexico and uh, the basically startup as far as I understand that is a startup um, is called Illumexico, which is basically a shorthand for illuminate Mexico. And essentially what they do is they gather donations from around the world and you know, to other countries, paying for one solar panel, a small solar panel, is not that expensive. So through donations internationally, they can get enough money to buy one or two solar panels for a given community or for a given uh, household. And that can make a, a huge difference. So they have been connecting um, household by household, village by village to, to electricity, not to the grid, uh, just to electricity in general. And uh, sometimes they have been able, I think, as far as I know, get um, storage. So that is life changing for, for many families. That difference um, has created jobs. And this has all been through international funding, um, essentially as donations. And then the other example that I want to bring up is um, it's a network called um, Sunshine. It's kind of the Sunshine Network. And essentially what they do is they realized that the financing was, was an issue. So they did a crowdfunding initiative online and essentially all their projects are crowdfunded. And whoever invests in a, in a project, because that's what they're called investors, the investors actually get the payments back as the project starts working and generating savings. So essentially it's an online platform, which is where the youth typically excel and where they become disruptive. So through an online platform, they create the crowdfunding where they can get investors, installers, and households together in order to create this kind of job. So they've been essentially financing jobs and projects that otherwise wouldn't have come together. And they're already helping save families thousands of um, dollars a year. Um, so those are two of the examples that I have on the energy sector here in this country. Both projects I know um, basically from, from experience, uh, because I've, I've known these people for, for a while. And I think that's the kind of things that we can do, but I would also like us to get involved with the decision-making. So with regard to that, I would like to move to the next sort of um, question, which is through the SDG um, seven youth constituency, um, how, or yeah, essentially how can young people work uh, with stakeholders to design or lobby for policies or programs that will ensure um, the reduction of carbon emissions or the transition in general to renewable energies. Sure. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, even though I said that a DHLPF is not necessarily where change actually happens, and by that I mean that it's not that a specific event where change happens, right? It's not like two weeks change the entire course of the world. What actually changes the entire course of the world is constant action, constant pressure, constant climate policy advocacy. And that is where the all year round work comes into place. And one of the main ways in which UNNGCY has been able to facilitate that type of advocacy has been by actually engaging with intergovernmental bodies such as IRENA, um, that I, whose I always actually forget their full name of the acronym. But yeah, the Inter International Renewable Energy Agency, such as um, maybe some other figures at COP, some other figures at the HLPF, some other climate negotiators at the uh, UN level, and we can actually approach to them at a first, on a first name basis, or we can approach to them with more cohesive public, um, public political statements as a whole constituency in which we can all collaborate and have some concrete asks of what is what is it that youth actually need? Not in the sense that that is what SDG 7 and GFCY thinks youth needs, but we actually go through consultation periods. We go through uh, webinars that and seminars that are very localized, and then we extract that knowledge from youth all around the world. And that is one of the most honestly valuable systems that I've seen so far. 
um, as every other system is not perfect. Um, where right now we're clearly seeing one example of that in which um, Joe cannot really join this conversation, right? Because of uh, technical difficulties, but it is a system that we have in place. And even though it's not still able to voice everyone's voices and leave no one behind, it is still has been, it's still fairly functional, I will say. I have a question before, before I hand over back to Jorge. You you said how you you run uh, a series of, of consultation at the local level, then it goes up the pyramid and up the chain. So I have basically two questions. First of all, uh, I haven't been involved much with UNMGCY and how it operates. So this is a question to you, not direct to UNMGCY, but to also other bodies like we have Yungo and the one for CBD and all across. Are there, is there a proper mainstreaming mechanism back to the grassroots level? So that's the first question. Like you, you gather all this input and maybe you submit maybe to the COPS or what? Like I think in Katowice, we submitted the youth policy document to the COP25, 24 presidency. But is there a proper mainstream? streaming mechanism where we get all this information from the, the from all us and we cascade it down back to the initiative uh, my, my, my other question to of course you and also it's it's also to all of us because some, some of us are members of yungo and other platforms out there are there actual projects that have been designed let's say you and gcy or yungo or those have just said uh we are designing uh, like in 2020, we've decided to help uh, increase our climate ambition. We are, we are designing a global project that we want to implement actual projects aside from policy and all that actual project. Are there projects that have been designed at that international space that have been, are being or have been implemented at the grassroots actual projects? Yes. So in that sense, um, I will say that to my knowledge, there's no necessarily a formal mechanism that has our voices go to the uh, top level constituencies and then come down. But what is to an extent even expected is that us, uh, whoever is selected as a thematic focal point does not only serve as a facilitator or just a quote unquote another politician, but we are actually to an extent expected to voice whatever decision making has been done at the top and then try to implement it at a grassroots level. Apart from that, we do also tend to engage with, let's say, um, if I'm not wrong, Irina recently implemented um, a microfinancing and project structuring type of tool in which basically startups that are uh, youth-led can apply for some form of microfinancing so they can run whatever project they have in mind. And obviously after being a screen and also a screen for success, as well as being screen uh, for um, someone that can serve as a, some type of a mentor, because we don't necessarily want to just just fund whatever project, right? We want to actually see you succeed. And at the same time, whoever has been engaged, has had any type of higher level engagement, at some point needs to realize that you do need to make it come down to the bottom, to the grassroots level. You don't you don't scream into the void and hope for something to come out. You actually scream into the void and then come back and scream to where actually stuff can happen. But yes, I will say it is important to have a very, very meaningful and concrete discussion of what can we do in order to have a mechanism to put it at the, bring it back to the grassroots level. Otherwise, I don't see change being possible by 2030. Thank you very much for that. Maybe over to Jorge and Maria as we wait for Joe to settle in. Right, so one of the things that I wanted to, to bring up was this um, willingness from Irina to actually start opening positions for youth within their own headquarters um, in order to actually help influence the decision maker making process and also the capacity building. Because as Mauricio said, it's not just about creating a financing um, structure that can help um, you know, get started. It's actually about helping 
um, use go through with the project and succeed. That's what we actually want. So one of the things that Irene and other international organizations of the sort can can do is actually help out to build this, you know, it's not just a network, but just the the platform and the resources, everything in a in a cohesive way so that it's not just policy, it's not just financing, it's a, it's a complete environment for youth projects to move forward and succeed. And, and I think there's been a lot of willingness from IRENA and I'm sure that um, Sustainable Energy for All and other of the platforms that the constituency can um, have handy, you know, because of how they are involved with the UN overall, they can, they can actually help out quite a bit with, with this process. Um, with the policy making, which is one of the parts that still is fairly important and to have governments actually commit resources to this transition, I think um, we serve as a bridge uh, between the, you know, uh, uh, from the SDG seven uh, perspective, we serve as a bridge also, not just use UN and other parties, but also the UN and our countries themselves, our legislators, our decision makers, they, they're not necessarily familiar with some of the research, with some of the um, events that are happening, with some of the key reports, some of the key findings, some of the experiences from other countries. So I think um, one of the things we've seen is um, some collaboration between us that have been able to bridge some of these um, gaps. Um, and on that note, speaking about governments and what they're doing, one of the last questions that I had for Mauricio today was, you know, countries who are mostly based on oil, who have historically depended on fossil fuels, um, are not making necessarily um, the investments that are needed, um, or are they? Or what, what's your, what, what are your thoughts on um, the financing that is going towards renewables from these type of countries, and what can possibly be done to make a shift in the, at least from a financial perspective? towards more renewables? Um, for these questions specifically, this is where um, the main reason why there's two thematic focal points for financing for renewable energy comes into place, actually, um, because um, my co um, my other peer, uh, Rita Rizvi, uh, she will be the one that will be the best fit to answer that. Uh, she's the one that handles the more uh, <laughs> specifically pol policy financing for renewable energy. I am a lot more focused in the corporate side of it, um, mostly because of my, that's my main field of work. But I, in that sense, I can say, it, what I can say is that there's still a lot of stranded assets that are not gonna be necessarily put into use for various reasons, um, specifically you see it in the in most emerging markets that we don't necessarily want to keep on funding carbon extraction, we don't necessarily, we have seen like putting private investment banks are not looking to fund carbon extraction and are looking to fund um, gas, new pipelines, oil extractions in some areas, just because it seems that certain resources, the investment in certain resources are not gonna be able to pay off. At the same time, there's still, um, going back to a more worker focus and just transition lens, you don't, you don't exploit a country and a country's workers in order to make another country rich. And then once that other country has been able to transition, uh, have a quote unquote fair transition, you end up demonizing those assets, right? There's um, a weird international financing dance with that idea, I will say. Uh, I will say that a lot of um, a lot of oil intense, oil, OPEC plus countries has, have been um, utilizing a lot of their earnings to fund renewable energy. In that case, there's still this major question of is OPEC plus funding renewable energy to actually transition out of um, polluting energy or non-sustainable energy, or is it doing it just so we can have a um, big oil 2.0? So let me let me just make a quick follow up. Um, 
what would you say then, given that, and, and I've, we've talked a little bit about this um, before this session, that you do in fact focus a little bit more on the corporate side. What do you think is the role of um, investment banking and other corporations, big corporations in the shift towards financing more renewables and avoiding this issue of stranded assets? Hmm. Well, in that sense, um, first of all, I will say that I, in order to prepare for this meeting, I actually listened to a lot of the other webinars that have been posted in this on the YouTube channel. Um, but I think one of the main um, and one of the main highlights that I think everyone can agree upon is that managing capital and wealth management, it's extremely important. That is where a lot of the assets around the world are there. And we just need to find a way to properly link them to link them to renewable energy technology, link them to startups and stuff like that. But apart from that, there's also the whole sense that the best way to facilitate success in whatever mission you're trying to accomplish is by tying economically tying success from both parties to that one goal. In this case, I will say the role of a lot of asset managers, specifically wealth managers, um, someone brought up the example of BlackRock will be to make economic success from the various countries be tied to each other's success on the energy transition. Every, um, right now, just from a um, cost production point of view, or because of rights law, I think like every certain unit of production, it becomes exponentially cheaper after a certain point of time. Renewable energy has the head start and has a head start. Well, a lot of people thought that it had a head start just because of the insane amount of financing that it received. Um, as soon as everyone in the world realized, oh, well, I guess we need renewable energy. But right now, it's just going to become exponentially cheaper. There's no way in which that can be stopped. But we do need to figure out a way in which that financing can occur in such a way that it also doesn't exacerbate wealth inequality. You don't want to end up every single country to just be an energy rich country and have other countries still have perpetuate this economy of extraction when it comes to energy. Yeah. So in that sense, I guess a major point will be to tie economic success, tie economic and political and peace keeping success to energy. Um, and have it intertwined between our various countries, which the more time someone is fencing investment banking, I think you can see that it's actually happening. But it is still very, it's something to be cautious of. Uh, if I could jump in again, Hoy, I, I like the discussions around energy coming from a country that is currently running, I think, over 70% on clean energy. But aside from that, I, I feel like uh, we, we, we uh, the way we, we, we are going in this discussion, so talking about energy in terms of oil and, you know, basically it's focused on the big short energy. What, what, how, what, 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 what might we have to say about, because when you think about energy and we come down to the grassroots and local level, we can start to think about energy in terms of, you know, the firewood at the grassroots for people in Africa, I don't know, yeah. So what, what form of local, you know, localized energy forms, aside from live alone the oil and the nuclear and the gas, those are very high level. How can young people basically get engaged on issues around, you know, the basic renewable energy, such as wood, firewood, you know, briquettes, basically a form of energy, you know, initiatives that are like that, and not so, you know, the high level and the complex. So maybe if maybe Mauricio or Jorge or Maria, I'm sure Joe would have a lot to say because I know Joe has worked, is working a lot on such forms of energy in Gambia through YVE, but because of the technical issues, he might not, you know, in Africa when it rains, sometimes electricity and Wi-Fi becomes a bit of an issue. I don't know if 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 Joe can join us. Joe, are you able to join us, Joe, and talk about a bit of your work on energy? You know, Joe, are, are you able to join us? If not, maybe Mauricio, Jorge, Maria, we could we could we could dive deeper into these energy discussions, especially. Yes. 
Okay, I want to first suggest, Joe, if you don't mind to turn off your video and then maybe you can just speak using the mic, that could help. Do you want to try that? Because the video may be the one that's um, um, mm. causing a delay in your internet connection. And then you can just speak using your microphone. Um, I don't feel I'm actually having problem with the connection. I don't know whether you are hearing me. Um, basically, uh, we are in raining season. So, Okay, maybe while he's trying to to fix that, I just wanted to say something before you go like down to the rural and small scale um, renewable energy accessibility. There is this thing that that ha recently happened in the states, which is that Blackstone um, wrote to its shareholders and declared that they're going to be transitioning to um, investing in clean and renewable energy. And that was like a major, major thing because Blackstone basically invests, it's an investment management firm, as you know, and they invest, they used to invest in the oil sector. And because of what's been happening with the climate strikes and the momentum behind the, the, the Paris Agreement, they decided to shift their focus and they told their shareholders that that's what they will be doing. But but also, as you are aware here in the States, it's that, first of all, the president isn't, he doesn't believe in the Paris Agreement. So obviously he is, he supports uh, oil production and um, businesses that are like going into fossil fuel production. He doesn't really support like transitioning away from it. So obviously I think that in order to help with transitioning away from fossil fuels, you also have to have leaders that believe in that cause or that will support that policy at the national level. And if you come in that, well, if you have that obstacle, then maybe it would help to figure out at the uh, state or the local level, which other actors, if it's like private actors, which other actors could help push the um, clean policies, even if you have a president at the moment who doesn't support it. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. So I think the last few points that were brought up could actually lead to a full session on its own. Um, there's a lot of very interesting things here to pick up. I wanna try to answer some of those things, um, concerns about the um, you know, the smaller scale, and also how the youth can get involved. Um, one of the things that is usually neglected in the energy side of things is that it's not just generation of electricity or not just for transport. It's actually, for example, clean cooking. And clean cooking is a, is a huge issue for developing countries and it's a huge issue for, you know, uh, equality. And, and it goes to gender equality and social inequalities that we have to um, address. And I think um, one of the success stories that I may be able to share with you is uh, from, a, from a friend who is actually currently doing his master's or just finished his master's in the Netherlands. But while he was still in Mexico, um, he developed uh, a stove, uh, uh, an right. energy efficient stove I... that could be shared. Um, oh, I think, um, is that, I thought that was Joe um, reaching us. If, if you can hear us, I think, um, It'd be, it'd be a good um, strategy to turn off the video and maybe we can take advantage of the few oh, moments you may you have with us. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, um, it'd, be, it'd be probably better if you could um, turn your camera off. Um, that will probably enhance the audio quality. No, yes.
Joe, uh, Jorge, maybe you could continue what you were speaking about the clean cooking. Yeah, so essentially going back to these two very important topics, I believe, energy efficiency and cooking. Um, bringing them together could actually help reduce emissions locally, which actually lead to the local air pollution that was one of the biggest issues um, in, in, in these um, households that Rain. still use um, wood to generate enough energy to actually be able to cook. Um, and again, I think Joe, um, I don't know if he can hear us, but I, can, I would like to pause for a second because I'm sure he has a lot to say about this particular topic. Okay, then I'll, I'll continue with, um, with some of these points. Um, it's not just um, energy efficiency that can be there, but actually innovation. I was just reading about solar uh, stuff, stoves and how easy they could be built. And again, one of the things here is that it doesn't have to be super nice. It doesn't have to be super fancy. It doesn't have to be, because essentially what you're improving on is it's not that a very developed technology. So I, I've seen use developing new technologies in stoves, new technologies in solar cooking in order to be able to help people feed themselves. And sometimes, sometimes what you're replacing with energy efficiency in, in rural areas is um, very expensive lighting. So actually you save them money by having these small innovations or these small gadgets almost when it comes to solar, for example. That's one of the nicest things about solar that is distributed and it can be a very low cost compared to other um, options. So I, I think that's where we can make a huge stride towards equality, towards having food security, towards having uh, full access to electricity, which can be a game changer when it comes you know, to uh, purifying water. That's one of the projects that I worked in the past. It's actually uh, my thesis project essentially for college. Um, you, can, you can power um, water purification systems in order to allow hospitals, schools, households to have um, drinkable water. You can have cooking. You can have electricity that allows you to have internet access, that allows you to study at night. Um, and again, for a modest cost or for projects that, as I said earlier, could be financed through um, you know, international donors. I think that's, that's a huge game changer there. Um, and one of the other things that I wanted to talk about was transportation, because green jobs does not have to be just green energy, it can actually be a cleaner way of having transport. And that for, you know, financing that has actually already been happening. And I think I talked a little bit about this in the past session, but this new mobility and this new normality has, at least in many countries, and particularly, I can tell you, in Mexico, um, created opportunities for use to push forward um, new biking lanes, the emerging biking yeah, lanes in, in the country. Uh, most of them that I know about have been either pushed forward by youth or youth have been directly involved with, with this kind of projects. And that's a huge uh, amount of finance going into new, you know, roads and infrastructure, green infrastructure, essentially and also um, that's creating jobs. And one of the things that we know from the past um, recession in 2008, 2009, was that investing in the highways, for example, was a lot less job intensive than investing in local, um, either public transport or local mobility solutions. So that's one way that you have also been involved and having, and you know, essentially succeeding in creating change and creating jobs that relate to reducing emissions. So those were some of the things that I wanted to, to bring up and hopefully that gives um, some answer and some light into what Dolphine was saying, because that's more local, that's more um, you know, immediate to satisfying people's needs and not you know, just talking about nuclear or talking about the electric grid. Um, so I don't know if Mar Maria, you have anything else to add on that note or Mauricio, if you have anything that you would like to, to say, I saw you nodding um, with okay. some of those things. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, so I really wish I knew earlier that the conversation was going to dry, uh, go towards renewable energy and also at the localizing it because so I also worked in the past with um, small startups in Africa, so Kenya and Uganda, where I'm from. And two of them, one is called Ikobora and the other one is called by Africa Energy. And basically what they are trying to do is that they're trying to bring clean cooking solutions to the villages in those countries. Um, uh, because most of them, if you know, I know you're aware of this, Jorge and Mauricio, is that they, they have to travel a lot of miles just to get firewood and, and like to help with their cooking and also for lighting and, and all that stuff. So this, these two companies were basically trying to solve that problem, transitioning away from the dirty fuel to more a more cleaner cleaner cooking solution, which is using of pellets. I don't know if you've heard about them, but like pellets, it's basically tiny. Um, how can I say? Like they, they get uh, waste, kind of like waste, and they compact it into tiny pellets and they use that to produce fuel. Now, the biggest challenge they had was access to financing. And I think that that's what really impedes, it impedes the transition from, from fossil fuel to clean energy is that the, these startups that are trying to help with that transition don't have the financial support a lot of people will offer them as um, what's the word technical support, but when it comes to like financing and helping them scale up, they don't have that access or people aren't willing to invest in them. And I think that that is something that needs to be addressed. So Mauricio, now this is a question to you. How do you think that startups in developing countries can um, work to increase access to financing tools and instruments that they desperately need. Hey, thank you. Um, that question actually has been coming up uh, quite a bit for me recently because I recently started reconnecting with a lot of people in Peru. Um, turns out there's a lot of Peruvians in um, UNMGCY, specifically in SDG7. And a lot of the people that I know from there um, have a very strong as just a technical background. They have a lot of technical support. They are looking to scale up. They have uh, quite a few projects with microgrids. And a couple months ago, I honestly wouldn't wouldn't have been able to tell them, yeah, you know, you need to do these things. That's how you're going to be able to get financing. But something that youth that have had the chance of having these type of high level engagements can do is use our positionality as a ways to go to other stakeholders as they will be banks and negotiate as other people, as just people that see ourselves as change makers, proper ways of microfinancing. There's um, right now, from my understanding at least, there's not a there's not a lot of fund, funding, at least from the private sector uh, point of view, on the way for renewable energy specifically, there's still um, a big, How's it? A big sentiment that it's mostly the big corporations that should be the ones allocating funding, um, the big energy, oil, gas, whatever companies, the ones that should allocate funding for renewable energy because they are within the energy sector. But that mentality has been changing, I will say. Um, I would say in most emerging market, those startups should be should be able to, to an extent, have coordinated localized action because I do believe that coordinated localized action, even though it's um, exhausted of financing, can still unify people's voices in order to be able to demand that financing they need. And if they cannot get it from one stakeholder, let's say private sector, then they can ask for it from governments. If they cannot get it from local governments, then you can find more creative ways of financing around it, as in asking maybe other intergovernmental organizations at a much higher level. You can ask other countries, venture capitalists, to for that financing. Obviously, tying, um, I'm going to borrow this uh, phrase from another one of the webinars that you hosted, but partnering up the financier with the proper financier. And I do think that that willingness of you to play around more with the rules of being a, 
a lot more flexible and not having to adhere to very rigid institutional guidelines, it's that youth has as an advantage. Um, <clears throat> in that sense, yeah, I do believe that that is one of the biggest powers that you have that we don't necessarily have to adhere to any institutional guideline in order to be able to obtain the financing that we want. And if we cannot get it somewhere, we are gonna be able to get it somewhere else. And that is actually one of the main projects that we have on, undergoing that UNMGCY um, with Rita, we're trying to um, search up of basically form this package of information that if you're operating in this type of market, these are who are your immediate, these are the stakeholders who are your immediate allies because everyone to an anyone who has been tried to make any significant change at the grassroots level within the energy sector already knows who are the immediate allies in their localities to an extent because it has been because people have been trying to make this type of transition for years for decades already so identifying the localized allies and then identifying who are the other stakeholders that need a little bit more convincing or negotiation to cooperate with and actually having that type of package be delivered to them as information as concrete information or a concrete maybe even pipeline to be able to tell them hey you know you want to make this project happen these are the stakeholders that you need to cooperate with these are the ones that are already willing to cooperate with you these are the other ones that you need a little bit more convincing and maybe hopefully we can support them at a bit of the higher level in order to make them more prone to financing those of the startups. Okay, so I, I just want to ask Joe if he wants to try and, and uh, say something, because we see you joined the stream. Joe? Joe, we can we can hear your background, but we can't I'm not hear so you. sure. Yes, Dolphin, go ahead. So I think I can able to speak. Dolphin, would you like to take over? All right, so I can go ahead now. Yes, I Joe a few I can ask Joe a few questions. So Joe Joe, you you if you if you'd like, I Don't. think you if you if you're able to tell us uh, yes, Joe, are you able to hear me, Joe? Are you able to are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear us, Joe? We can't get you properly. Wow. Hello, Joe. We we hear a bit. Are you able to hear me? <laughs> Joe, are you able to hear? Are you, are you able to hear hear me? I think Joe is still having a bit of uh, technical issues. He's yes, he's he's not able to hear us. But just a brief about Joe. Joe works for Joe is the executive director for YV Gambia. That's the Young Volunteers for Environment. So YV Gambia, YV is an international organization. It's so called JV in the French speaking speaking nations. So YV deals with uh, young people who are doing a lot of. Uh, advocacy and also actions on the ground on the environment. So they're basically volunteers for the environment. So he has been able to, together with his colleagues, he's been able to run a few projects and initiatives on the ground. So he's been able to set up green te green technologies, which we were hoping that he'll be able to share with us today, and how basically he's been able to sustain young people through such technologies. But due to 
network issues i i'm not sure that will be possible today so because he's having a bit of uh technical issues from his end i think network isn't so good but we can we, we can make do with with what we have so may, may maybe you know because uh africa is 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 basically the continent with the, with the largest population of unemployed young people and any opportunity to 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 create a job so you'll find that most young people according to some study uh previous you'll find most young people if 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 you're either unemployed majority is unemployed and only a few is employed even within the em- employed lot of young people they, they are usually underpaid or unappreciated or they can't basically make ends meet so some of them sought to uh, side hustle they call them the, the side hustle so side hustles sometimes they come in the form of agriculture which also sometimes becomes a green job because most people have resorted to agriculture because of the immediate returns then we have other other initiatives such as the green uh, technologies for example the briquette initiative that has taken up a bit of shape within with within africa and there's a lot of young people who are actually engaging in such kind of initiatives and such kind of technology and uh joy is actually the one of the few africans who are actually dealing with such technologies especially in africa so i wanted to know how basically it he has been able to to basically finance such green technologies within Africa and basically uh, to look at the gaps that may exist and how basically they need to be filled. But I, th- I think for me, w- one thing that I could mention of the book is maybe the attitude of, of basically the young people towards green jobs, because you'll find green jobs, they're not usually the white collar jobs. And growing up, I think, when young people grow up you you're told to become a doctor or a teacher or a professor you know white collar jobs but right now there are not so many white collar jobs so you'll find the major one of the key challenges in 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 africa i think is the attitude the perception of young people towards green jobs because green jobs will entail issues like agriculture climate smart agriculture so as 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 maybe young people for other young for maria i know you're from uganda or and mauricio as we wait for joe to be comfortable enough to be able to help us drive this conversation what do you think is needed to influence the attitude of young people towards green jobs that are not so much aligned to the white collar jobs so I can see Mauricio is excited, and yeah. So we could start with you, Mauricio, then Maria, and Moya, as we as we wait for Joe to to come back on air with us. Yes. Sure. Um, it's actually a very um, interesting question, mostly from the standpoint that within the global north, there's this um, consensus that oh, you work for the environment. Wow, that's so wonderful. That's so amazing. It's very um, romanticized to an extent. But that romanticization of working for the environment comes from the standpoint that you don't necessarily have other major things to worry about. It comes from the standpoint that you're already at a certain point of um, quality of livelihood that you can then choose to do something as quote unquote self, no, this self interest, um, not self-centered, I, the antonym of that, sorry, I forgot the word for that, um, self, selfless, thank you. Um, so it comes from the standpoint that you can afford to do something as selfless as to work for the environment and anyone that it's a um, climate advocate, climate activist is basically seen as some type of a hero within the global north, but that only comes after you're able to, well, first of all, appreciate what actually working for the environment means. It means that you are working not towards just making your own livelihood better, but Better, but you've also accepted that your own livelihood and own quality of livelihood is intrinsically tied to everyone's other quality of life. And at that point, it's something that can actually drive a lot of people. Like, I, at this point, me and quite a few of my friends and me, um, we have fully accepted that this is the line of work that we're going to be doing for the rest of our lives. And we're completely happy with it, like more than happy. We're like, like this is our dream line of work but it also comes after we're able to address certain uh, points of certain, a certain quality of 
of light that we can say we're comfortable with this life and that we can keep on working for that. So I think it's very important to say that in, in wherever quality of life is not necessarily the best one, pinpoint, pinpoint exact issues that need to be resolved within, um, let's say, energy transition in this case, and say, in order for you to have a better quality of life, you're going to be able to work in that you're going to have to work on this. And it's something extremely noble, I will say, to dedicate one's life to do work with, towards the environment. And because you're basically working towards your entire community in your locality, but also in the entire world. I totally agree with everything you said, Mauricio, especially when you say that in the, in the Global North, um, activism or environmental stewardship is a noble, is viewed as a noble cause. Whereas if you go to the global south, you have people who it's practically their livelihood. And if they don't find a way to make it sustainable, it affects how they live, where they get their food and things like that. And so for me, I think it's important to try and figure out how to, um, how to fix the financing issue and make it sustainable because I think like also one of the challenges that I have seen with um, young green entrepreneurs is that when if you if you pick them when they're going for funding like let's say it's a series A or what if it's um, uh, what do they call it seed funding or series A or series B funding and you pick someone from the global south, um, with someone who has someone on their board from the Global North, then the person who has someone on their board from the Global North is going to get the funding because unfortunately, those who are giving the funding who are from the Global North want to give it to someone they trust. And for them, they, if they see someone who's the same color as his, their skin, okay, that's automatically uh, checked check box of their funding strategy, which honestly is not a good way to finance um, or to help people in developing countries, forcing them to put someone on the board who is not even from um, their country just because they're trying to get funding. I don't think it's a good thing, it's a good practice. And unfortunately it's practiced a lot in the investment management space. Now, that being said, I think that maybe we should talk about alternative funding and alternative investing. So things like grassroots financing, getting the local community or doing crowdsourcing and crowdfunding may be a way to curb some of these issues that are faced. And then also the other thing is, um, what was it? It's like incentivizing these young, young organizations because whereas here in the States, you can you can commit to climate action or environmental work because you have like other uh, sources of income. Unfortunately, in developing countries, that's not the case, and that's all they have. So maybe we should also think about how can we incentivize uh, startups and young business leaders in developing countries to continue doing what they're doing. And now I'll hand over to Jorge. Maria, before Jorge jumps in, I just one quick comment. I like the way you say incentivizing. Sorry if it's not the right pronunciation. I like what you've said because currently we, we there's actually a program that I think the our government was was trying to run here in Kenya. It's called the Kazi Mtani Initiative. So Kazi is work, then Mtani is a Swahili word for how do I say? Uh in at home. So work at home. So it's basically the government is paying young people to do these jobs, like to clean the streets and do such initiatives. And there's also, I think, another initiative I had. It's it's basically the the earn as you grow campaign. So basically, you plant a tree. So the higher it grows, the higher you pay. So those are some of the initiatives that I, I actually like when you talked about incentivizing. So maybe we this need to shift more to the to come full board to go into the environmental campaign and not just the broader campaign. But with that, I can hand over to Jorge. And then maybe we could see if Joe is back. Yes. 
So there's a couple of things that I would like to to mention, um, and I and I think I'll start forgetting each one of them as, as I move forward. But what Dauphine just said actually just reminded me to some of the programs that we have here in Mexico about creating jobs from basically afforestation. Um, however, they didn't have this. I like this clever idea of paying for keeping the tree alive, and the higher it is, the better. Um, I, I like that. You know, that kind of follow up is fairly good. Um, one of the things that you brought up earlier was this notion of um, having a strong preference for one color versus another. And I think that can be solved a lot through the education system and the trainings that are given. Um, if there is a, if there is unemployment, we, we have to kind of figure out why, because reasons may vary. Sometimes it's just because the skills do not match the needs. In, in some cases, um, it might be that. I mean, in those cases, we really should focus on the training. Um, however, if there is no incentives, as Maria was saying, then even if you have the skills, it's just that the workplace, the workforce is saturated. So what can we do in order to change that? And I think the incentives part is, is key um, in order to do this. Um, there can be very different ways of looking at incentives. I will, I'm very interested in how, in general, um, jobs can be funded through public investment versus private investment and how this can come together to create synergies. Um, and it comes back to what they were talking about earlier, matching the right investors with the right kind of projects or the right moment in time of the developing of a technology, a project or an idea. Um, I, I think that's key. Um, and there were, there were two more things that I wanted to mention. Um, but, before I forget, and I, I want to highlight this situation because access to energy, reliable energy, reliable electricity, and reliable internet access um, is key even to, ra to, ra to raise our voices to access information. And this is actually what's stopping us from hearing what Joe has to say right at this moment. So th this, is, this is key, and this is happening around the world where education is um, actually depending right now on different technologies, either television, either internet, um, whatever it is, relying on technology Hello. Hello. when most of can your population you doesn't have access. It's an issue. And right now, Joe, I think we can hear you well. So let's take advantage of that. Hi, I am able to be part of just to Hello, highlight you what me? you do, uh, well, your work, and how you work. Yes. You. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Let's see. Is that okay? You can go ahead, Joe. All right, thank you very much. Uh, actually, all right. For an organization called Young Volunteers for the Environment, uh, which is actually um, So we have access in basic energy, water, health, and sanitary capacity, climate change, natural resource management. Joe, please unmute yourself. Kindly unmute yourself. Joe, can you can you, can you yourself? Let me know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have on. Mute. 
tell myself, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Just go and we can hear you. Wait. Did I, I stop from technology? Hello. Hi. Yes, we we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, Hello. we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. All right. And then my voice will be lost. So basically, Okay, I think that Joy is having really, really bad difficulties here. So maybe what he, so maybe what you can do is write is write down for us, and then we will we can broadcast it. Okay. Organization uh, um, our key specific of advocacy include. Um, policy monitoring, um, citizen participation, youth empowerment in youth policy. So unfortunately, Joe is having a lot of technical uh, issues and I think he's just log. I think at some point, yeah, technology is becoming quite a challenge. It was actually raining and when it rains, uh, there's that slight, uh, slight gap. But we can try to call him. We can see if we, we could get through to him. But meanwhile, we can see what we can discuss. Um, Dolphin, I wanted to bring to go back to the financing issue again because, um, and and I also want to hear what Mauricio has to say about this is how how to solve because jorge even when you say when you're talking about like access to clean access to electricity in general through solar i can tell you now that there are there are companies and startups in uganda that are struggling to provide as basic as solar lamps to villages and they can't um they can't continue doing so because they don't have financing to do so. And I think that people really underestimate um, the value that money has in, in making things happen. And no one is really talking about how to bring the financing down to the communities or the 
the businesses that are helping to bring this electricity to those communities that need it. So I don't know if Mauricio, this is something that uh, you as UNMPCY are tackling, like when you're, you're doing your, your policy, uh, creation of the policies and negotiating, because I feel like people aren't really taking it seriously. They see a business that is, is uh, for example, has invented or has has innovated a solar lamp or solar bags and things that can help school children in rural communities. But then all they do is stop with the praise and they don't really continue with the funding. Yeah, so um, within UNMGCY, as um, it has been recently um, created, uh, sorry, SDG7 specifically, it was just this year, we are in, we don't have any specific efforts into trying to localize every single type of funding. The one effort that we do have has been uh, partnering partnering with Irina, specifically um, creating that uh, seed funding type of um, tool, and also trying to structure, basically guide um, startups and our youth-led organizations through what will be basically a business proposal type of um, segment. It is extremely necessary to do that type of funding, however, most, but I do think there's um, this general consensus that a lot of people, that a lot of that localized funding should come from localized government actors. I don't necessarily um, agree with the fact that that's just gonna happen on, happen on its own. I do believe that we as a large network, a global network, we have the ability to put a bit more of a, global pressure into some local actors wherever it's needed. I do believe that it's something that needs to be um, not discussed, but act upon, honestly. I, yeah, I'll make sure to take a note, to take an oath of this and so we can have a very, very quick, not quick, sorry. So we can quickly have a conversation, sorry. So we can soon have a conversation about this because it's something that really needs to um, be addressed of the fact that local, Localized action must be informed by its global impacts and global agents should be able to put pressure and ask and actually lobby for this type of local action. But yeah. Maria, I actually like uh, when you bring in the financing aspect into this discussion, it reached just a, like for a comment. Recently, we were, we were told uh, the government came out for the first role. I think it's right now that the government is actually recognizing uh, the key role that young people actually play. So our Minister of Environment actually came out and say, young people, you need to go out and plant trees because you have more to lose because it's it's you who's going to be there ahead of time. So you need to come out and actually, and actually uh, take action by planting trees. But then I come and ask myself, is there an enabling environment for me to actually come out and take action on issues of climate change? And when you talk about enabling environment, it comes to financing. Is there financing to even get maybe the seedlings, you know, a place to stand? And when, when uh, the way Mauricio has said, the local government has to now come in and, you know, basically come in and bridge that gap because of funding in the event that, okay, we, we want to plant trees. We, we can't go to the national level because there's no national, it's so also divided into sub-national and start, where will we get the land? So I, I like the idea that the local governments and local authorities need to get involved and actually even maybe provide the financing, maybe part of financing for actually young people to actually take action because as unemployed young people, as unemployed young people, people across the world. how do you expect us to go plant a tree when maybe i've not sorted out you know my basic needs how do you expect me to deliver without yeah without the financing so there are, we shouldn't just i think people look at over the time we've looked at young people as just you know for advocacy and csos we need to look at young people as you know the the next people to take over these seats. And for us to do that, they need to be an enabling environment, even at the local level. So I like the way you're headed towards local governments taking action. It actually reminds me of, of what you actually said, Maria, that when someone from the global south applies and the counterpart from the global north applies, the global north uh, 
you young person, let me say, might get it as compared to the young person from the global south. I prefer if 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 a, if a young person, if I'm a young person from the global south and I want to apply for maybe resources from the global north, I think we should have a co-financing aspect to that to do that international source of funding so that I have the backing from maybe my government, you know, or from someone from a force from the global south to help me, to vouch for me, because I don't have as much influence as my counterpart from, you know, the global north. So this issue of co-financing, it, it should also come in, which, which, which basically calls for some sort of, for your government to be able to back you up to that extent, there is need for government to stop looking at young people as we are supporting young people. We need to be looked at as partners. So we need to form those sort of intergenerational partnerships, even when bringing the financing aspect so that you, you work with me, you vouch for me. Yes, I'm a young person. You want me to go plant tree and I don't have the money. You might not have the government as the government, but I can go with you to a foreign donor and you can stand on my behalf and we get the money to do this. So I think these are really, really good discussions that is, is going through. So I'll hand it over. Uh, maybe Jorge, Maria, Mauricio, anyone? Yeah, so there's something that I would like to, to add here. Um, one is a given perspective. The other one is one of the conversations we had during the um, Climate Action Summit back in September. Um, so first of all, um again a little bit back to the having the right person right entity right, right institution to find the right kind of project um talking about the projects that we're mentioning it, they're much smaller than what traditional banks or you know this kind of institutions are used to one of the things that i was listening to recently um from the uk pact which is an initiative from the united kingdom to finance projects um that are you know, pro-sustainability that will create green jobs in different countries, Mexico being one of them. They were saying this kind of entity is used to financing projects on average that are upwards of $2 million, more, $200 million, say. So when you face energy efficiency projects, you have projects that are 50K. This, this is many orders of magnitude smaller than what they're used to financing. So how can you do that? And that's where these kind of alliances with the government, sort of what Dolphin was suggesting, I think, are key, because they can indeed um, break it down into the, the smaller um, segments and the youth can actually help to implement. And one of the things that we came up back in September to try to solve this, and I mean, this is by no means uh, a completely new way, and I'm by no means the expert on the, on the matter, but we did talk about the potential of doing the following. Instead of a, a developing country um, government investing directly on financing projects and um, specific programs, having them have essentially a backup, having a general fund that could serve as what Dolphin was saying, something that would take away the risk from the investors from outside in order to leverage more resources than what the government could initially provide directly by themselves. So by doing so, the government has a stake. The government wants to make sure that the projects actually succeed. But also from the investor's perspective, you have someone backing up your money. And you can actually pull away if you need to, if you want to, if you choose to. And again, it's about creating the general environment that will allow um, cash flows to go where money is needed, but also to the risk um, away from you know, what can be perceived as technologies that may not pay off or investments that may not pay off. There, by having a fund that is an intermediate there that is backed by a government, a national government, you can actually have a, bring more trust into the, the, the whole issue. And again, implementation can actually be done quite well by the youth who know their local, um, not just the local authorities or government, but the local context, which is even more important. Um, and, and again, capacity building is key. It's not just giving the money. It's making sure that you give them every possibility for um, you know, the whole enterprise to succeed. And for this, uh, and again, not the expert here, but the CTCM, the technology transfer mechanisms, are actually very handy. 
because they do know that it takes more than just the funding, but the transfer of technology, the transfer of knowledge and capacity um, is key. But what Dauphine was saying and what has been brought up earlier about the right kind of people for or institutions for the right kind of project actually can take us a long way. And the crowdfunding was one way in which it could be solved because you were having the micro loans and micro financing for smaller projects that maybe the big investment banks will never ever take a look at, but that could actually be quite attractive for, for a different kind of investor. So that's all I wanted to, to bring up. That things are being talked, things are being thought about, things are being tried. And I think technology with um, some stronger institutions and you know collaboration with multiple agents can be key into solving this this kind of situations. And that's what I wanted to, to just bring up. So I hand it over to Maria, I think, who hasn't spoken in a bit. I don't know, Mauricio, did you want to say something first? Um, sure, actually. Um, I had a, I do know what, I have a little bit of experience when it comes to um, systematic and economic reform at the localized level, in the sense that there's a lot of cash flows that actually escape localities rather than remaining in the locality. That is in the main way in which wealth is often concentrated within the global north and we have an economy of extraction in the end, right? Um, one of the main ways in which um, not only youth, but pretty much every single stakeholder needs to be involved in a, in order to change this type of system is in localizing and localizing wealth creation and creating a circular type of economy within our, the locality. In that sense, um, there's various ways of doing it. One of the main ways is of uh, rather than seeking financing from outside sources, if there is enough financing within the area, sometimes there is because, uh, but it's just that that money is being saved up, saved up or invested somewhere else in the world or given to another bank and that bank is just outflowing that cash somewhere else. Rather than having that, you can have type of cooperatives, um, cooperative enterprises, or rather than having a, a external venture capitalists come in and give all of the seed funding, you provide the seed funding within the locality. Having said that, that is not necessarily plausible for everyone and it's a very high risk because anyone that has been able um, to partake in a, in a fam seed funding or Series A, Series B, Series C funding knows that it, within the Global North, in a Series A, you end up with like one to, one to $5 million in funding and that's expendable. Like people, every single investor there can afford to lose that money and that's okay with them. To do that in a locality, you cannot afford to lose a thousand bucks. And that is just, yeah, that having that as a solution as in like creating a circular economy, a very powerful move movement, very powerful move. If it plays out nicely, wonderful you have just created a whole ecosystem that is going to perpetuate itself and is going to generate wealth within the locality it falls short you end up with a huge huge crisis within the locality that you're going to need double or triple the money to just get back to where you started oh that doesn't mean that it cannot happen but yes Yeah, uh, thank you for that, uh, Mauricio. I mean, I, I also agree with what you're saying. I wanted to say something about uh, the funding structure at the local level. Uh, I like the idea, but then there, there, as you know, like with all ideas, with all um, ideas or structures, there are challenges. And one of them is like the corruption that's in some of these local communities. I mean, okay, so you will say you're going to give a community a hundred thousand dollars, and the local government is in charge of that. You find that a lot of um, the leaders within that government want to first take a portion away as like their reward, which you haven't even like uh, accounted for when you're sending them that that money for investment so i feel like I, maybe that's just something that's going to exist there but i mean it's something that we've seen a lot in developing countries is the corruption is is terrible i don't know what how it is here in the states but i know that 
where I'm from, the corruption has been really bad. Um, and then I want to say something about my uh, the grants, not the grants, but the micro system that um, Jorge was talking about. I mean, you're right when you say that investment banks are not going to finance small ticket size projects. They are looking like a million dollars plus. So how are you? How do you? Uh, how do you? Um, position these small businesses to get ready for that funding down the road because like you said it's not only just about the financing but it's also about their success in general and how they impact their community so how do you position them but I also want to say that some of the selection criteria that these investment banks the venture capitalists use I think is restricting in some cases because they have this whole host of things that you need to meet before you apply. And maybe there needs to be a way to address that. And I don't know. I mean, I understand it's good for accountability, but there is such a thing as um, making barriers greater than they actually should be. And that kind of like defeats the purpose. Yeah, I think um, a lot of what's been said um, has been very interesting, very enriching. I think um, the actual little details may may fall through in within the conversation, and um, we may not have time to just clearly lay out um, how how step by step things can should or could work. But um, I th I think um, what we're seeing is that there's innovation, that there's the will from certain um, areas. And I think that's part of what we're, what we're working on and what we need to succeed at, creating that will to, to you know, address these issues, to solve these problems. I think going back to where we started today is that we already have multiple crises happening and we're not accounting for the risks um, accordingly. So I think um, there's quite a bit that can be talked about, but just to start to wrap up, I think... Um, there is uh, a lot of initiatives from the youth and there's a lot of space for that to grow and actually have succeed, actually have impact on the local and you know national levels. Um, I don't know if there's any one of you who would like to say uh, the last few words before we start um, closing not only the session, but the whole series of um, these transmissions. So Mauricio, would you like to, to say a last few words uh, before we start to wrap up? Um, sure. Um, there's a, I mean, I haven't been involved in the whole process of the entire series, but I have been able to listen to some of them. And I do have to say it's quite powerful. You've been able to manage to gather up a group of wonderful people that have experiencing all sides of um, financing for green technologies, financing for uh, sustainability. You've looked at the carbon um, carbon pricing. A lot of work, a lot of information that is going to come in handy for for myself, and I'm very sure for a lot of other people that are either getting started in the sector or need a refresher on the sector or want to dig deeper into some practices. And people are most likely going to be able to connect with each other. As I said at the very beginning of the talk, even though I was quite nervous, I'm now a lot more relaxed. I do think that it's very important to for meetings to generate this type of concrete action. I, at this point in time, I think the best concrete action that we can do will be to connect with each other. Will be to keep on strengthening this network that um, is UNGC wide. That it's uh, the um, whatever organizations everyone is part of already um, that I even don't have knowledge of because we just weren't able to voice them out right now. But that is a concrete action. And also for any of the viewers to also reach out to us, I think that will be very valuable. That I don't think any one of us will be op completely opposed to the idea of, hey, I want to help make the world a better place. No, don't talk to me. No, we're all very open in that sense. So yeah, I would just really like to say thank you for me and also for all the other speakers that you have invited and even the ones that are, have not been able to voice their voices right now. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate this event. 
Thank you very much, Mauricio. I think um, definitely one of the key actions is going to be to, you know, stay in touch and keep bringing those networks together and collaborating um, across borders and across organizations. Um, and speaking of that, I really want to appreciate the different organizations that make this series possible. Um, Green Champions Program, uh, BLI Global, Citizens Climate Lobby, um, Africa Youth Panel, the IYCM Climate Finance and Markets Working, the Finance and um, Market Working Group and ECOS Community. And I think um, Dauphine and Maria also have some speakers they would like to mention. Um, Dauphine, you have your mic muted. Oh, sorry. I, I think I, I can speak for all of us. When we began these sessions with Maria in June, we weren't sure how this would pan out. And it, it has actually been a successful three-month session. So this first phase has been very, very very interesting and very educative even for us as the moderators and the speakers and if i can recall back to some of the session just the first session we did was when we launched it was a soft launch it was driving climate finance after COVID 19 and we had four key speakers we had maureen maureen Nagimulo, who's from the gcf and the office in tanzania but she's currently studying in the states then we had diane from Marvest, I think that's sort of, I don't know the uh, pronunciation very well. Then we had Mr. Jubril, who gave some very insightful uh, insightful uh, comments. And, you know, he really incited our audience and drove discussions, especially around climate finance, as, yeah, basically giving the global and the continental aspect. Then we had Eduardo. Eduardo is from the World Climate Simulators uh, World Climate Simulators. He's, he's, he's actually been a professor, he's a professor, but he actually introduced the CIRUS, which is basically a capacity building tool that can, the CIRUS and the ENDROS, the first one was called CIRUS, and then the more complex one is ENDROS, which deals with energy. So it's basically a tool, a simulation that can be run with people across uh, the broad. Personally, I've run CIRUS with students, but ENDROS is even for the policy makers and even. So, that I think was 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 one of the best sessions, and it it basically kicked made us start on the right notch. So Maria, I don't know if you remember some key sessions, Maria. Maria. Yeah. Um. So yeah. After that, we had the carbon. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. After that, we had the carbon pricing for green economy, and we had carbon markets watch. Aita. Um, who else was there? Uh, John McQueen um, from his own uh, enterprise. Then we had John Gage from CCL, um, Giles and Marwani. Marwani was from Africa Youth Climate Hub. And from uh, from Carbon Markets Watch, we had Nicholas and Elaine. We had Aita from Aita. And they were speaking about like carbon pricing. And that session was very technical because all of them had presentations. So if you want to watch that, um, I would encourage you to have like a notebook and a pen so you can take notes. Then we also had the private sector involvement in pushing for green financing, um, which was very insightful, um, where we had uh, Grow and Family Fund, if I remember, and, and a couple of us, other powerful speakers, including Athena, Marilyn, Stacy, Edward, and Chinma. And then I can hand over to Dolphin and Jorge to talk about the rest i think my for me for me i think my favorite was the one that we, we we didn't initially we didn't have it on the schedule but just something just popped out and we did a session on linking climate finance to article 6 so climate finance was a key issue because of issues of long-term finance and the drug negotiations and article 6 also are very critical and key issues and we had very, very fruitful students and very nice speaker. We had Peter Ango from the GCF NDA office, who is a mentor of mine. There's also, we had Miss Sandra Guzman, who is from the Latin America Climate Finance Group. So, so we had a bit of 
the African region climate finance, then Latin America perspective. Then we had Olofunso Somorini, who is actually from the Africa Development Bank. He's the principal coordinator for that. And he's actually, he's also, I know he's, he's also part of a lot of GCA processes. I know he's, he's working also with eCraft in some proposal, I think, Kenya. They, then we had Antoine Dimitri. Uh, Antoine was very insightful and he kind of brought in the uniqueness that these other two didn't actually have in the in the in the other sessions i think the, that to me was was actually one of the best sessions that we have had so far i don't know if Jorge, you'd like to maybe you know maybe give your views on your best sessions for the remaining sessions that we had okay sure i think the last session um how to lobby your government for youth inclusive financing was pretty interesting. I think we had a very interesting discussion with Jesse, um, how he was mentioning um, working with the government, working with senators, trying to, you know, get them involved. Um, also, we heard from the European Union perspective of how it is to work in Parliament and how the conversation is going from a different uh, perspective. Particularly in this case, he was, um, um, I think, it was uh, Kirani. Who was giving us a perspective from a from a specific party, but also with an understanding of what else was happening in uh, the European Union with different um, points of view. And we also had um, Catherine um, Gage also telling us a little bit of her perspective. And I think Mary Jane actually added quite a bit from the African perspective on how difficult it can be sometimes to be prepared and to you know have the negotiators um, ready. For, for what it's for what's needed and that that was pretty eye eye opening to to have the four different perspectives that we had on the table that day and I think lastly today um, we actually saw as I said earlier firsthand what could happen if we don't have equal access to certain opportunities and in this case something as basic as a reliable electricity or internet access um, what it can mean it means you you basically um, miss out on opportunities, chances to speak your voice, chances to acquire knowledge. Um, hearing from Mauricio and from Lisi was amazing because of the perspectives that they bring, um, unique in their own ways. And we get a better sense of what's actually happening and what may need to happen and how we can start getting involved, which was something across the series. So what I really enjoyed was that we had some things more practical, some things fairly theoretical and very, very like heavy, dense with um, Sandra. I think Sandra Guzman was very able to bring it down to um, a level of reality of where we're at, how things could potentially go wrong and that we may not um, just be able to rely on a single solution on a single thing um, to, to solve this huge problems that we have. I think that session to me was great because our speakers were able to bring such a complex issue and topic to a very real and practical level. And hearing the youth and how the youth can get involved in the past couple of sessions, what well, to me at least was was pretty great. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Maria for maybe a few closing um, remarks on or reflections on the past few weeks and sessions we've had. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say thank you so much to all the people who um, honored our invitation, including you, Mauricio, and we are hoping to do another season after a while, and we hope to also encourage a lot of collaboration uh, across the board with other constituencies and other working groups in other different constituencies, because from this conversation, I can see there's a lot that we have to we could cover together on like a, on a whole range of other issues so i just want to acknowledge that and like thank you for that and maybe i would call on dolphin to briefly speak about uh, something that we are planning to launch in the coming months dolphin would you like to say that and then we can close this session this season yes so uh having you know having Having revised uh, the session, having gone through these six 
six very educative sessions, sessions and also having been on the ground in Uganda, in Kenya, everywhere on the ground and having a diverse group of young people. We have seen there is a lot of difficulty for young people to actually engage as they should on issues of environment and climate change. And in light of that, we, 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 we began this initiative uh, with Varia of creating an enabling environment for young people across the globe, not just Africa, not just Asia, not just in the US, across the globe, to be able to effectively, you know, engage on issues of climate action and also environmental protection. In light of that, Varia and I are looking to uh, to steer or to catalyze uh, some sort of global financing for young people on climate action. Yes, so this global financing on climate uh, action for young, so it's the Global Youth Climate Action Fund, which is something that we are looking to work on. And this is something that we would want to work on not no, not alone as young people because we can't do it alone by ourselves because we might not have enough capacity as as it is as young people we are looking to work first of all amongst ourselves so youth from across the different uh, parts of this of this of the world basically we are also looking to work with key entities such as uh, the UNFCCC and you know uh, the World Bank. GF, GCF, and that. Maybe from there, I can hand over to Maria to add something to it. Maria? Okay, so so briefly, because I think we are over time, is that we are planning to launch the Global Youth Climate Action Fund, and we shall have like a whole other um, launch, launch, like launch ceremony for it. But that's that's basically as a result of all these, all these, um, episodes that we've done we've realized that there's that gap and there needs to be a bridge and so that's what's going to that fund is what we're hoping is going to be able to bridge the financing gap to help our young people around the world continue or uh, grow their their youth uh, startups in climate action and environment so that will be like a whole other we're hoping to launch that in the coming months and um we shall obviously send an announcement about it. Um, and so, yeah, we just wanted people to know that that this is not the last that you'll hear from us and hopefully we will have other sessions um, in the near future. And so with that, I would like to close the session and thank everyone for having attended and watched this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.